today comes from Matthew 6, 1 through 4. <clears throat> be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their full reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. These are the words of the Lord. Man, it is good to see you this morning. I can tell you right now, you are a brave bunch. The fact that you're here and braving the snowy tundra of Lubbock, Texas. It, uh, it's always unique, the, the weather of Lubbock. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. It's kind of like the refuge. <laughs> anyway, um, really enjoyed our first service. It was really small and intimate, and I actually got to sit down on a stool and get to speak, but uh, I'm going to yell at y'all today, so I had to stand up. But I'm really glad that you're here. I want to say hi to everyone on Facebook. I know a lot of you have decided to stay home. We don't blame you. Uh, it doesn't mean that these people here are more spiritual than you. It does. <laughs> no, <laughs> we just want you to know that, man, we feel your heart here, and I hope you feel our heart as well. And just want to say hi to my folks on the hill. You know who I'm talking about. And, um, man, just really want to say Happy New Year to everyone. I hope you've all made some New Year's resolutions that will break in about, oh, a week or so. But this morning, I want to talk about something different, more than just uh, a New Year's resolution. It's, it's more of a challenge for us. Um, and, and it's something that kind of goes against our Christian culture today. Uh, but, you know, I know I'm talking to the refuge. You really go against all cultures sometimes. But... Today, I want you to know this. God desires to speak to you today. Do you believe that? I need you to understand that. And that's one thing that's really beautiful is that God is still active today as he's ever been. And it's our time. It's our time to hear the Lord. It's our time to be obedient to the Lord. And so this morning, I want to talk about Jesus in this brief moment that he had with his disciples and his brothers that it really explains a lot about what culture of Christianity should look like. However, today I feel like we've gotten off pace with that, and I want to bring us back to that. Before we start reading in John chapter 7, verse 1, I need you to understand, before this happens, before this brief moment happens with Jesus and his disciples and his brothers, Jesus has just finished healing someone at the pool of Bethesda. He's also healed an official son. Jesus has fed 5,000. He's walked on water. And so there's this momentum taking place in his ministry. People are beginning to notice. They're hearing about him. They're seeing these miracles. And, and there's this great movement to come to Jesus until he, he's in front of a lot of people, especially the religious elite. And he says these words, I am the bread of life. And he made a parallelism to where the Hebrews, uh, excuse me, the Israelites, they were saved from Egypt. They left Egypt and God rescued them and they were out in the wilderness and they were hungry. So God sent manna from the sky, from the heavens to feed them. And Jesus was making this understanding that I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. If you eat of me, you will no longer be hungry. And they begin to go, wait a second, that doesn't make sense, Jesus. And Jesus began to explain it even more. He says, unless you partake of me, of my flesh and of my blood, you won't have that relationship with God. You won't be able to enter in the kingdom of heaven. It has to come through me. You have to, he said this again, eat my flesh. And a lot of people are like, that's too much, Jesus. That is just way too much. I mean, we're talking about cannibalism here. The sad thing about it is Jesus always speaks of heavenly things. It's us who tries to make his heavenly things human things. 
And his desire is to take our human things and make them heaven things. And so we see this thing. And, and what's really cool about Jesus is he doesn't apologize for his words. Now, all of us in this room, we have experienced moments where we needed to apologize for our words. Because a lot of times the words that we speak do not have truth in them. I, I'm sorry if that offended you this morning, but I need you to understand right now. Your opinion doesn't mean it's truth. I don't care how many likes you get on your post. And see, this is, this is kind of one of the things that's happening is they're not understanding. And, and Jesus begins to say that. So look what happens. He has all this momentum. Then he says, I'm the bread of life. And these disciples, his own boys, his, his own people begin to go, I can't follow this. And they left. He had this great momentum, but then he spoke truth, and a lot of people left. I want to say that again. Here comes Jesus, great momentum, then he speaks truth that people don't like, and they walk away. Guys, that's happening more today in our Christianity than I believe has ever happened since then. That we've taken this Christianity and we've made it ours Instead of dying to self and accepting him. And there's a difference in that. And we need to understand that today. And so what happens is Jesus is now left with his, his disciples. And he looks at his disciples and says, hey, are you guys wanting to leave too? And I love what Peter says. Peter says, no, we're not going to leave. And the reason why we're not leaving is because you're the Messiah. And Jesus goes, that's excellent because that's the Holy Spirit that revealed that to you. And they said, we don't have any other place to go because where are we going to go? Once we've experienced you and have a relationship with you, we can't go back. <laughs> we, once we've really gotten to know you and understand you and shared life with you, there is no going back. I mean, I could go back, but I'll never be able to deny the fact that I've been changed by you. In fact, some of you in this room, you've had that experience with Jesus before. Then you got mad at him. You started running away. What happened? He taps you right on the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, no, 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 get away from me. Get away from me, Jesus. I'm horrible. I can't. And Jesus is like, whatever. Wherever you go, I will be there. Well, notice what happens. Jesus' brothers and his disciples begin to speak to him because they need Jesus to understand something, that he's in this beautiful opportunity and, and Jesus needs to act now. Has anybody ever heard that? Act now before it runs out. Hurry, limited time, limited offer. You're going to miss it. That's how the world works. God does not work through chaos. Can I get an amen? amen. In fact... God is the peace in the midst of chaos. And if there's ever a time in our culture, from the beginning of time, it is so loud right now. Everybody is screaming. Everybody's pointing fingers. Everyone is saying this and that. In fact, and I'm not just talking about other entities i'm really talking about the church and i know i'm probably gonna get some letters from pastors that watch this but the reality is i'm gonna read something that should absolutely make us all stop for a minute never in my existence maybe some people who are older than me can attest to this maybe you've experienced this but in my lifetime i have never seen the church more politicized that the church is now saying if you don't think this way you're not a Christian. If you don't vote this way, you're not a Christian. I'm here to tell you right now, God is not a politician. God does not care about what man cares about. Obviously, he's going to care about the Super Bowl, Pastor Travis, because we all care about it. No, he doesn't. You can pray all you want. Doesn't mean your team's going to get in there. Can I get an amen, Cowboy fans? Why don't we just move forward? I, I can't say anything. I'm a Patriots fan, man. Good luck to us. Anyway, here we go. John chapter 7, verse 1. 
It says, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there, they were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, Leave Galilee and go into Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore, Jesus told them, My time is not yet here. For you, any time that is, will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that the world's works are evil. Jesus says to his brothers, you go to the festival. I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left ahead of him for the festival... He then decided to go to the festival, but not in public, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders there were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about Jesus. Some said he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for the fear of the leaders. Look what has taken place. Jesus' brothers have come to him and they've said, listen, I I know that we've had a setback. We had some momentum, but then we had a setback because you're talking about the eating the flesh and all that. Not sure what that means, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to where everybody is in Judea and you're going to do your miracles. Then everybody's going to get to see who you are. And then they say these words. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret so the question i have for you today is has jesus ever wanted to become a public figure you need to hear that today ladies and gentlemen jesus said no i don't want to go be a public figure i don't want to go show off the reason is my time has not yet come And I imagine the brothers are going, what do you mean your time hasn't come? This is the time we can show up, show out, and we could absolutely gather a crowd and we can overthrow Rome. This is the time. And Jesus says, it's not my time. You see, there's a different mindset of what's taking place in those who are around Jesus, his brothers, and Jesus For when they say, Jesus, your time is now because all these things that we think should happen can happen and you can make it happen. I want to say that again. Read between the lines, guys. The brothers said, listen, these are some great things that can happen and you can make them happen. Sounds like Christianity today. Oh, Jesus, here's my life. You can bless it. Now get to it. Jesus, here's what I want. Here's what we think is needed. So, Lord, this is what we're going to pray, and we think we know best. Jesus says, no. My time hadn't yet come. See, when Jesus talks about his time, he's not talking about there's going to be a time when I'm going to go show up and show out. Now, when his time comes up, it's to be a sacrifice for you and me. When his time comes, it's to die. And according to the brothers, if he would have told them that, they'd have said, no, 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 dying is bad, Jesus. Showing up and showing out is good. Listen, we've got the cameras there. We've called the news crews. Everybody's got their phones out. We're going to absolutely show people who God is. And Jesus says, no, no, no. When my time comes, it'll be self-sacrifice. You'll see me die. You'll you'll see me be beaten. You'll see me arrested. You'll see me die. And you'll be saddened because your plans didn't work out. Can I make a statement? Are you not glad that God doesn't answer all my prayers the way I think he should? I'm so glad God doesn't listen to me. Man, I I realize a lot of the things I ask for just come from straight self. 
even to the point when, when something good happens to somebody, we can't help but go, I prayed for you. You're welcome. This guy right here in Jesus, we're that close, and it was because of my prayer that you have been blessed. No, it, it's him. And God's plan for him is to die for you and me. Nobody celebrated it in the world. It was a failure to the world. All of his disciples scattered. In fact, there's really only one brother and his mother. Maybe some other people that were real close that were there when they watched him die. And maybe they were hoping, are you going to come off that cross? No, he died. But as soon as he took his last breath, guess what happened in the kingdom of heaven? That place erupted. Things that you and I can't even fathom celebrated. All of the heaven shook. You know what else shook? Hell itself. No wonder Jesus said right before he died, it is finished. How have we forgotten that? When did we get back to it being about, I want to do good, but I want people to see me? Pastor Brian read that scripture. It says, man, when you're going to do things for God, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Do it in secret. Don't do it to where everybody else can see it. That's what hypocrites do. And whenever they go to, for people to see them, they get the reward right there in heaven. That means you're going to get your stuff right here on the earth that you deserve. But if you want to be spiritual, if you really want it to be between you and Jesus, don't let anybody know what you're doing. Be obedient because of who he is, not because of what people see about you. I promise you, scripture tells us there's going to be that day when Christ comes back. And many people will be sitting there going, I'm ready to come in. I'm sure you have my mansion ready. And Jesus goes, and who are you again? <laughs> who am I? <laughs> Ask anybody. I went to the best church. Dude, I tithed more than 10%. I tithed 11. I fed the homeless. I did this. I did that. I did all these things. And Jesus goes, yeah, but I don't know you. Here's a sobering thought, ladies and gentlemen. Do you realize religion can benefit your life? If you apply the principles of religion, you will get a better life. Some of you in this congregation are now clean and sober. Yeah, that's awesome. Praise God. And you're going, I have money. I'm not getting arrested. This is awesome. Right? I'm not losing everything. I can actually keep a job. Right? Those of you in this room who God has said stop smoking, you got rich real fast. I had no idea how much I was spending on that. But the question is, religion, yes, it can benefit your life. But it takes a relationship for you to be changed. It takes a relationship where you walk with Jesus before things start really changing in your life. And, and when you walk with Jesus, it's really not about, am I smoking, am I cussing, do I look like this, do I dress like that? No, because when it's about a relationship with Jesus, you're just focused on Jesus. All that other stuff works itself out. And that's what this world needs. That's what our city needs. That's what your work needs. It needs Christians that are Christians that don't need to be seen. People who can make an impact that are not seen. They're upset with Jesus because he's not going up there to show out. Jesus doesn't have to show out. You know why? Because he's Jesus. No Christian should ever be in a debate. Oh, but I'm going to stand up for God. God doesn't need you to fight for him. He's already won. He just wants you to be a part of it. No, if we don't fight now, then this country's not going to recognize Jesus anymore. Do you want to know why the country doesn't recognize Jesus anymore? It's because it's met Christians that aren't authentic. 
You want to further the kingdom of God, you don't do it through policy. You do it through obedience. God brings all men unto himself. We don't have to glorify ourselves for people to see God. We glorify him. God will draw men to himself. He'll even draw men to himself that you don't think should be there. Some of us in this room are those people. Can I get an amen? I hear this all the time. This became popular in the 90s. Our church feeds the homeless. It's great, man. But do you know them? Do they know you? We get asked here all the time, how come you guys don't do a homeless ministry? (laughs) How many of you in this room have been homeless? Raise your hand. There's your ministry. Because we want to know people. And what's funny, those of you who've been homeless before, it's not hard for you to recognize someone who is that way. Right? And don't they always try to, to pull one over on you? Oh, no, no, I'm good, man. I mean, I'm just working. You know, I'm waiting for a management position and all these. And you're just like, yeah, I used to say the same thing. Come to the refuge. We got some donuts and coffee. We're going to love on you for a little bit. <laughs> Jesus went later on, but he went in secret. Jesus went because he, didn't, he, he went by himself so he could go in secret. I don't think he was trying to spy or anything like that, but I often wondered why didn't he go with his brothers. And the reason why he didn't go with his brothers is because when you have a Jesus that is your performance Jesus, you'll always say, oh, oh watch, Jesus will do this. I use this example, uh, first service. Does anybody remember the movie Home Alone? And you remember that part where he does this and screams, ah, and... Colin McCulkin, the actor of Home Alone, uh, he was little Kevin. He became famous for that to the point every time he went on a TV show or a talk show, they would have him do it. Ah, you know, oh, my God, it's so funny. Do you realize that as that young boy went around life, he could not go anywhere without somebody going, do it. No, no, do it, do it. No, guys, come here and watch this. Do it, do it, do it. And he couldn't be himself. Guys, that's Christianity today. Jesus, do it, do it. No, come here, come here, watch. Jesus, do it. No, no, quit talking about that. Do, do that blessing thing. I was like, come here, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Instead, what we should be doing is saying, what do you want us to do? It's not about what you do. It's about what are you calling us to do? And I'm telling you right now, he's not calling us to stand and be seen. He's calling us to make an impact unseen to be real, that we do it for him and nobody else. We do it because he told us to do it, not because we're trying to gain what I call heaven credit. Right, you've heard of street cred? Right, well we got heaven cred or spirit cred, right? Dude, can I pray for you right now? I'm gonna give you a huge prayer so I get some spirit cred. Oh, that guy's a prayer warrior, are you really? Do your words make God go, oh, he is so amazing. I promise you a kid who doesn't know how to speak right prays better than you. Someone who is broken and can't even speak, their spirit prays better than your eloquent words. Every time we got to quit performing. We don't have to be seen. We have to be obedient. We have to be a people that say, Lord, I don't care if it's popular in our culture or if it's unpopular in our culture. I will be obedient. And the thing about it is where we live in the Bible Belt, there's going to be a time when becoming or doing Christian things is no longer popular. Then we'll find out who the real Christians are. And I'm telling you right now, it's not the ones that argue for Christ. Do you know why people argue who they are? It's because they don't know who they really are. Look at what Jesus did. Did he argue with Pilate? Did he argue with the people that were condemning him? No, he just kept his mouth shut. You know why? Because he knew he's being obedient to his father. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I don't know, Pastor. The, the court of public opinion is pretty strong. Jesus didn't think so. Well, they killed him. Jesus himself said, they don't kill me. I give myself to them.
because that's what my father wants. That's what Christians do, guys. We're obedient, not because of anybody else, but because we have a relationship. Because he's called us to do something. And, and what's amazing is we always look for this amazing event to be a Christian. Has anybody ever heard this story where the man's walking on the beach and the tide had come in the night before and there's all thousands upon thousands of starfish on the, the beach and the sun's coming up and if the stars, that starfish that are on the side when the sun comes up, they're going to eventually die. So this man starts picking up one starfish at a time and throwing them back in the ocean. One at a time. Picking them up, throwing them back in the ocean so they can live. Another person comes up and goes, what are you doing? The man says, well, I'm saving the starfish. And the person said, there's no way you being one man is going to make a difference to all these starfish. And the man reached down, grabbed a starfish and said, I'm making a difference to this one. Picked up another one, making a difference to this one. Right? No, no, no. We're looking for the big thing. When God says, look for the one thing. The one moment of obedience. Do you know what would happen if, if, you know, we were at Buffalo Lake and the starfish, I don't know if we have starfish. If we had starfish in Buffalo Lake, it'd probably have teeth, but <laughs> three eyes or whatever, you know. Uh, that, that's no shot against Buffalo Lake. It's just, you know, they, anyway. It's so all the starfish come up and, and can you imagine if somebody put a modern church in charge of that, right? Well, what we got to do is we got to form a committee to determine if the starfish should be saved or not. And then after we do that, then what we have to do is we have to make starfish awareness. And we have to help people come together and, and, and pay and, and raise money for the starfish so that we can pay people to go and put them into the water. It's going to take six months. They're going to be dead. You see, God doesn't work by committee, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to make a statement. I guarantee I'm going to get some letters from pastors. God doesn't work through church. He works through his children. And it has nothing to do whether you're in church or whether you're at work or whether you're with your friends. Because if you change as you go around them, then you really don't know Jesus. Because we can all come in here on a Sunday and put our best Face forward, right? Who are you out there? And are you being obedient? Maybe it's opening the door for somebody. Imagine if God told you, go throw the starfish back in. Okay, Lord. Being obedient. You want me to take a selfie? No. <laughs> Hashtag starfish. I'm just saying, no. Be obedient for me. How long do I do this? Until I say stop. Next thing you know, man, this is a cute one. Oh, man, this one, this, oh, man, this is an ugly one. I want to say that one for sure. You need another chance in life. But, and you're <laughs> doing all these things, and you're throwing them out, and all of a sudden God goes, well done. Oh, but, Lord, there's thousands. I need to stay after it. You're done. Well done. Well, Lord, now what's going to happen? Next thing you know, here comes three other people. Don't know why I'm here, but God wants me to throw these things in here. That's right. That's the church, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. They didn't have to discuss, where are you from? Where are you from? How do you think Jesus? No, just the obedient ones. Why are you here? I have no idea. I don't even like starfish. They're gross to me. Here you go. Because <laughs> that's what God sees. Scripture tells us that on the day of the Lord, there will be many people that come expect to be entering to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus will look at them and say, I don't know you. In fact, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was in jail, you didn't visit me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. And they'll say, but we went to all the church events. We did, I mean, ask anybody about us. They know who we are. Jesus said, you didn't do these things for me. And then they say these questions. When were you sick? When were you in jail? When were you naked? And Jesus will say, 
when you refuse to do this for the least of these, you refuse to do it for me. Then he looks at the believers and he says, now you guys, you get to come because I know you because you clothed me when I was naked. You visited me in jail. You fed me when I was hungry. And you know what the believer said? When? When were you naked? When were you hungry? When were you in jail? And Jesus said, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. And you know what the believer said? Well, that's just who we are. It's just what we do. We don't have to declare it. I mean, it's in our blood. It's who we are. We've been changed to that. Where I used to hate these types of people, now I can't help but love them. That's great because they now love you too. It's not about how you look to others. But can you make an impact? Because you're obedient. And when you make an impact, can you do it to where you're not seen? I want to end with this. When I was a young man in my 20s, and understand this about me, I was born and raised in a Christian home. I went to church all the time. I went to Christian schools as a young kid. I had know how to pray. I know how to do all that stuff. But I never knew who Jesus was until I was 21 years old and I was broken. That's when I came to this understanding that, wait a second, it's not about me. It's about you. And it's not about you adjusting to my life. It's about me adjusting to your life. When you reach that moment, ladies and gentlemen, we call that sanctification. That's when you're sanctified, when you wake up. It ain't about me. And you know what's really cool? It doesn't matter where you are. When you have that moment, it's real. You could be on the top of a mountain. You could be locked up. It ain't about me. And I remember when I was 21 years old, I was like, Lord, it's not about me. And that's when my relationship with God really started growing. And, and I started learning and I began to be changed without even trying to be changed. In fact, I would be changed inside and I'd be going, man, God, what are you doing? Give you an example. Have you ever just cried for no reason, men? Yeah, if you, if you don't like crying, guys, here, here's a joke for you. I just want you, JP, all you guys, I mean, you're, you're tough and everything. Here's my thing, you ready? Pray for compassion for me. And then ladies will laugh at them because they will cry and they don't even know why they'll cry. It happens. Listen to a song, see a commercial. God, oh my gosh, I want to pray for that person. Go ahead, tattoo man, pray for them. And I'm going to tell you something. We can make fun of it. I'm going to tell you right now, you're never as strong as you are until you're broken for God. Ask Peter that. It was when he was broken before God, he became the rock because he came to this realization. It's not about me. It's about him. I don't need to be seen. He needs to be seen. I asked Jesus after I read this relationship as I was developing, it was in my thirties. I asked God and I really sought it out. I said, Lord, how come we don't see healing today? Like we read about in the Bible. How come we don't have that healing? And I've talked to theologians and people and they have this opinion of, well, you know, healing back then was so that Jesus could be seen and, and it was for his ministry. It doesn't happen like that today. And then I hear about, oh, no, no, it's because we don't know the formula or it's because we got too much sin. And I'm here to tell you right now, this year at 48 years old, I finally got my answer. And I'm going to tell you how, but I can't tell you the specifics. I was on my way to work out and an emergency happened. I can't tell you the specifics. And, and the reason why I can't tell you is because I promised I would never glorify what happened. But there was a huge issue and a child was injured and people had to move quick. The people that were at this place didn't know who each other were. They weren't friends. They weren't acquaintances. But there was an issue and people came out of the goodness of their heart. And I'm telling you, as I'm there, I don't know the people around. They don't know me, but God shows up. 
to a way none of us can even speak. And this child is healed right before us. I don't know how. I don't know the injuries. I don't know what. But we're all sitting there in awe, not of each other, but of God. And as we all got up and everything was okay, we just went our separate way. Nobody had to post anything. Oh, you won't believe what happened. Nobody said, I was there and I acted quickly. No, it was just us going. Okay. Lord, thank you for letting me be a part of that. I'm going to have to try to process this later on. Right? Almost tripped. <laughs> when that happened, I realized something. I felt that God was speaking to my heart saying, those healings, they do happen today. Amen. You just won't hear about it. Because the people that are doing my healing... They don't seek glory for themselves. Do I believe people are healed in the hospital? Absolutely. But you'll never know who did it. Because it ain't about them. It's about him. And they don't need recognition. They don't need to be seen. They don't need it. Oh, no, no. We got to declare the miracles of God. Really? Don't declare it. Just look around and see it. How about this? Be the miracle of God. And a lot of you in this room right now. You are a walking miracle. We don't need you to declare it and develop a really cool testimony for you to share and develop a ministry with your name on it. But we need you to find someone who's just like you. And you go to them privately and you say, I will walk with you. And I'll bring you to a place where there will be people who will not judge you. Who will feed you donuts. And now we have amazing coffee. And they're going to love on you. Oh what are they going to do? They're going to try to change me? No. They're just going to get a front row seat. As God changes you. This city needs it. Our homes need it. Let us be the refuge. And may we make an unseen impact. Out there. Can I get an amen? Let's stand together. Father, we come before you today. Lord, I thank you that you are not a God that is all about publicity. But Father, you're opposite than that. You're a God that is about changing the one. Father, every one of us in this room, every one of us watching on Facebook right now, we are a one that you sought after. So, Lord, I pray right now that you would give us the strength, that you would give us the courage to be love in a world that is losing its love. That we would be peace in a world that is losing peace. Father, that we would not operate in chaos, but we would be still and obedient to what you are calling us to do. And we know this right now, Father. You've called us to love well. So, Lord, right now, we dedicate this year to you. A new year, a new whatever. Lord, may our challenge be, this year, Father, use us to be an unseen impact wherever we go. For we are about your business. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming.